The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John. It's a little longer than normal. This is a, a pretty regular Lenten scripture. It's also my probably my favorite character. So just sit back and relax. We've abridged it as necessary, just in the essence of time. This is John 4, verses 1 through 42. So Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. And it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food and meat. And the woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me? a woman of Samaria, because Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well with his sons and his flocks that drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me the water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, <clears throat> I have no husband. For you have had, f and Jesus said to her, You are right in saying that you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. So what you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you, Jews, say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is here now when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth, for God seeks such as these to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know I know Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. And if you're following along, jump down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed of his word because of his word. And they said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. May God bless and challenge us in the reading of this word. I am so grateful for our music ministry. Amen. So we've got this beautiful piece of music. Bach, right? Bach? It moves us to a place beyond where we were just a few minutes ago when we were listening to the scripture. Yes? It's the power of the spirit 
and moving in and through our music ministry, in and through this sanctuary, and it blesses us. It invites us to join in, to shout, to sing, to rejoice, to praise, to worship. Thank you, choir, for leading us to that place. Sometimes I wish I <clears throat> that we had our worship leaders and choir around 24-7. I want to reach that place all the time. I want to reach that place of worship in spirit and in truth that we just heard about with the story of the woman at the well. She was moved beyond where she was. She was moved to worship. What do we know about her? Like most of the characters in scriptures, not much except that she's just like us. She's been through some stuff, amen? Lots of stuff, amen? Hard stuff, amen? Yeah. Stuff that scared her, scored her, scarred her. Stuff that stigmatized and stuck. Stuff that she swallowed down. Stuff that weighed her down. And like us, she had stuff to get done every day. And sometimes, like us, she got behind, and sometimes she got cranky, and sometimes she felt like she had it all together, and other times she felt like giving up, and still other days she felt like she was unsure whether she was actually going to make it through the next hour. And the small stuff, like us, she tried to laugh off. And the big stuff, she tried to face with a brave face, except when she didn't except when she couldn't. But anybody, somebody has to go and get the water. Where's that darn jug? There you are, right where I left you, trusty friend. She'd had that jug as long as she could remember, a gift from her mother for her first, no, second wedding. She remembered her mother's words, too, as she handed her the jug. This will probably last longer than that guy. And though her words had stung, she was right. Five husbands in that jug was the only thing that was still with her, along with her mother's voice, of course. <laughs> along with a thousand other voices she just couldn't silence that were just as deprecating. So she picked it up by its slender neck and she felt the coolness of the clay in her hands and she ran her hands down the sides. Was weathered, yes. No major cracks. A mm -hmm. few chips, like her. But it had served her well, and not just for water. It was the one thing she could count on, one thing she could be sure of, one thing in her life that she depended on it was there all the time, and it was a means to taking care of herself, getting something as simple as water when others couldn't or wouldn't care for her. Stepping outside the house, she feels the heat of the noonday sun. She hissed an expletive. Why not? Nobody here to hear it. Gone were the days of going for water with everybody else. That stopped around husband three and a half. On her way out of the village, she walks as usual, eyes front, ignoring the head shakes and the eye rolls and the condescending smiles. She grips the jug a little bit tighter, like a security blanket, and starts picking at one of the chips on the bottom with her fingernail. Hang on. Almost there. And she struggles to quiet those voices in her head. It's your fault. You're a mess. You're so stupid. You're a victim. You're a sinner. Failure. Screw up. Shut up. And 
she tightens her grip on that jug, and her anger is fueled, and she speeds up the hill. Her body propels itself, slightly hunched, maybe, with intention, head down, moving so rapidly, she bumps headfirst into Jesus sitting on the side of the well. Tripping, her precious jug lays heavily in his lap. Embarrassed, she lifted herself up, but she kept her eyes down. She couldn't bear one more rebuke, one more word. So she just stood there, exposed. But in that window of vulnerability, before she could regain her defenses or get herself back together, Jesus gently hands her jug back to her. She blushed. She accepted the gift gratefully, gingerly even, but then suddenly aware again, stood up straight and crossed her arms tightly around that jug and she put her head back and she pursed her lips and she narrowed her eyes. But Jesus, he just sat there in front of her, looking at her. No judgment, no eye roll, no condescension. His face was wide and open and pleasant. Give me a drink. Now I'm not sure how much time passed before she responded. With Jesus just sitting there looking at her like that, wide and open and pleasant. How long did it take her to find it within herself to even answer, to create even the smallest space for a conversation with Jesus, a space for divine spirit to move and live and have being, could she handle one drop of living water? She was already so full. How, how could she move all of those piles of regret and remorse that consumed her? How could she chip away the voices of her past that had poured into her being, mixed with experience and hardened like concrete in the depth of her? What would be able to pull down the thick, dust-covered drapes that hung heavily over the windows of her heart, efficaciously holding in the very darkness that held her? Why are you asking me? She whispers. It's all she can get out. Arms still crossed around the jug. It's barely audible even to her. But it's all she had. It's the only space she can create, but it, somehow that's all the space that Jesus needs. And Jesus steps in, squeezes in to that sacred space, and then all of a sudden makes it as wide and open and pleasant as his own face. And they talk theology and tradition and tribulation and tragedy. And she can name her truth, her whole truth. What's happened, her problem, her shame, her confession, her pain. She unfolds her life to Christ, totally transparent. And Jesus, he's still sitting there, still looking at her, face wide and open and pleasant. That's what forgiveness looks like. It's offered before we ask it. 
She is forgiven. She was forgiven. She was forgiven before she even reached the well. She knew that now. And Christ knows her, knows all about her, everything she has ever done, everything she ever will do, and loves her. God loves her. And to fully embrace God's forgiveness, finally, she uncrosses her arms and sets down her precious jug and everything it represents. What she thought she could depend on, her self-sufficiency, her coping mechanisms, her defenses, her ego, her hardness, her past is in her past. She lets it go. She sets down her jug, and then she sets herself behind Jesus. And she worships in spirit and in truth. Then sings my soul, O oh, Savior God, how great thou art. Let's stop here. We need to notice this person's life situation hasn't changed one bit, had it? The things that happened to her, her history, her life, those voices, her scars, still visible. We think sometimes that when we have this kind of an encounter with Christ that all of our scars will magically disappear, the hurt will magically end. We can just let go of everything, including all of our hurt, yet our scars stay with us. And if you don't believe me, think of Jesus returning to the disciples in the upper room after the resurrection. He's freed from all bounds. He looked death in the face and rose beyond it. He was totally transformed, yet what is the first thing he does for the disciples? He shows them his scars. His hands, his feet, his sides. The things that happen to us, they are always with us. They're part of us. But in Christ, they no longer have power over us. They no longer weigh us down. They no longer are our center. Jesus becomes the center of our being, not the scars. And when that happens, then we begin to see our spirit. We begin to see ourselves as God created us. The truth that we are made in the image of God. We are created in the likeness of God. All God is, is in us. Transparency, yes. Forgiveness, yes. We just need to let go to receive the freedom to worship that comes with that. We can't manufacture it. We can't stand here week after week with our hands raised, pretending to worship when we haven't gone through this letting go process of things that we need to dump. What's in your jug today? What did you come here clasping so tight that you couldn't let it go because if you did, you'd be giving up everything you're sure about. Everything that protected you. Everything you held on to. I want to give us a time that we can kind of unburden and I want to take it us just into a time of just short of prayer that you can practice at home. This is strictly for uh, something that you can use when you're worshiping at home. And I pray that you do worship at home. I pray that you worship in the park or in a field or anywhere you want. But I would ask that uh, if you would just center yourselves for a moment, just pray with me. God, we come before you holding on to whatever we want, wherever we're holding, whatever protected us, whatever disarmed us, whatever helped us cope.
and we find a space for you. Help us to create that space. Help us to breathe. As we take time now to just breathe through and be in that space with you. God, you know all about us. You know exactly what we need for healing. You also know the things that we've done. We lay them before you. As we unfold the things of our heart, we know that you will not condemn us. You will not judge us. We trust you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your acceptance. Thank you for your love. Thank you for you. Thank you for life. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.